He's the one uh, founded uh, Christian Care Minister at uh, the MediChair program in 1993. Since start the MediChair home, he grew 189,000 members and chair about 25 million medical every week. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm personally, I it's here before, and I like my personal opinion because the, the character he has, he remember my grandpa. Um, last time I hear you, when I come back to, to the chat, I'm, I'm, I'm stronger, and I feel like a, I can do a better job when I hear you last time. I hope I do it this time too. Welcome to Jan. Let us start with a little prayer. Father, uh, you certainly work through a broken vessel and when you work through me, uh, not only flaws and uh, inconsistencies and so forth, but work, work through me that uh, someone might receive in order through your Holy Spirit. Christ in the name of Christ. Amen. 1620. A small ship is bobbing across the Atlantic, coming from England. It's called the Mayflower. About two thirds of the way across, two young men by the name of Francis and John Billington, young rascals, got into the powder magazine of the ship. And young young Francis put a residue of powder in the palm of his hand and touched it off with a candle. And he flung it out, and sparks went all over the powder room miraculously, with powder on the floor, and those powder kegs around. The ship wasn't blown to smithereens, and she went to the bottom. And those folks finally landed at a place that they call Plymouth. We'll jump ahead a little later. Actually, there was a there was a connection, which I won't go through, between the Billingtons and John Rogers. John Rogers from Duxbury. It's uh, 1649. And some Indians were crawling out of the woods in the war plane in the middle of the night and attacked their cabin outside of Duxbury. Rogers came out to challenge him in the front yard. Arrow went through his neck. And they found his body, with the, he had pulled the arrow out, they found his body with, in the grasp of his hand was the arrow. His family was slaughtered with the exception of four children who were taken captive by the Indians. And one little gal, eight year old, named Abigail, slipped out the back window and ran across the yard into the woods, evading the Indians. The mother was slaughtered. With the exception of those four, every one of them were slaughtered in that whole place is torched into the livestock. We'll move ahead. 1754. Nathaniel Richmond kisses his wife, three months pregnant, goodbye. And he joins 2,300 men in the French and Indian War heading up to a fort called Lewisburg. And three weeks later, he died on the wall in a storming Lewisburg. We'll move ahead. We're in Germany now. We're in Novitz, Germany. A young bastard by the name of Godfrey. His father is a wealthy man. His mother is a housemaid. They were never married, but the father did support his bastard son, Godfrey. Godfrey had step brothers and sisters who were very jealous of him, and at the age of 11, took him into the forest and hanged him and deserted, cut him off by a rope and left him for dead. In his death struggle, the knot of that rope untied, he fell to the ground, recovered, 
ran away, worked in the silver pits in Germany, and wound up on a cattle ship bound for New Orleans, tending cattle. He worked his way across, worked his way up the river to St. Louis. By that time, 1849, yet there was the gold rush, and he and seven German boys lit out for California to strike the rift, pushing a car, two long rifles, one pistol, all of them had long knives. One was killed by the Indians on the way out, and when they crossed the desert, they made three attempts and turned back each time because of lack of supplies. Fourth time, they said, we're either going to, if we run out, we're going to continue and die, or we're going to make it to the other side. They pushed forward in that fourth attempt. They got across. Godfrey's mother's father, back in Germany, knew folk medicine and taught Godfrey what he knew. And he nursed his system back on broths until he was able to take solids. The rest of the boys gorged themselves and they all died of cramps. He was the only survivor. He did strike it rich. He became a very wealthy man. He came back to Pennsylvania, bought a coal mine, five farms, found a wife, and started his family. What do all these events have in common? Let's go back to the Billington boys. All right? That Mayflower could have been blown to smithereens and gone to the bottom. It didn't. It was, a it was, it was an actual miracle that that, that that thing survived. John Billington was my nine times great grandfather. He survived that incident. He also survived, he got lost in the he got lost in the woods from Plymouth and got turned around and for eleven days he was in the wilderness, happened to run in, they had some very fierce tribes in that area, happened to run into a group of friendlies that brought him back to Plymouth. So again, again he uh, slipped the, the Grim Reaper. 1754. Nathaniel Richmond, when he left and was killed on the walls of Lewisburg, that lady that he left his wife, that pregnancy was viable when four out of ten children never made it to five years old in those days. That pregnancy was viable, and Nathaniel Richmond was my seven times great grandfather, and that viable preg pregnancy was my six times great grandfather. Thomas Rogers, or, or John Rogers, that little Abigail, she was my eight times great grandmother. That bastard from Germany, Gottfried Reinhold, was my great grandfather. So because, because they survived, I'm standing here. Ten generations ago, each of you have 1,048 grandparents. Every generation you go back, the number doubles, right? You have parents, great-grandparents, great-great-greats. And ten generations ago, let's just take that. Let's not go back to Adam right now. <laughs> In each of those generations, how many here have had a near-death experience? How many in how many in their in their in their parents or great grandparents or great greats know that they had a near death experience? War, whatever, accidents, disease. <coughs> All of us are here today because the Lord made a way for us in history. Mm -hmm. Trillions and trillions of years ago, an eternity past. The Lord God, creator of the universe, king of the universe, looked down to the corridors of time and saw each of you sitting here. Just as Jesus Christ on the cross at that moment when he took everybody's sin on him, saw each of us individually in his deity in a mini nanosecond. 
He was able to see each of us in our, each of us with the, every sin that we'd ever committed, all the ones that we're doing now, and all the ones we had lined up for the weekend. He saw each and every one of them. We're sitting here because the Lord made a way for us in history. Each of you, if you could turn the pages of your family history, could fill the bottom of how the Lord intervened and we're here today. And the miraculous part of it, it's all for a reason. I don't know how the message will impact anybody here, but I was given the message. I'm a genealogist by hobby. I've studied 17,000 surnames on my, in my parents. And I, I, I could literally, I could literally, and, and in the process of writing hundreds and hundreds of pages about how our line survived in history. And there's a book of 66, well, there's a, there, the book, the Holy <coughs> Scriptures, 66 uh, books in, that, in, that, in the Holy Scriptures that speak to what I'm talking about. All of our steps are ordered to the Lord. None of us are here by accident. None of those events just happen because of arithmetic probability. None of them. And you're here today not because of arithmetic probability. You're here because of a plan. And the Lord has a plan for each of us, no matter where we are, if we're sitting in this room 76 years old as I am, or sitting here 23, 20. that's what I said, 20. <laughs> 20 years old, life ahead of him. As a genealogist, I look at photographs of young people in the back. Photography came into vogue in the 1840s, and I look at those photographs of those youngsters with their life ahead of them. And they've moved across the stage of history off, the, off stage right, and right now we're on that stage, moving towards stage right. And from this point on, the Lord has a plan, and a continuous plan for all of us here. As we pursue, understand, and get in the groove of that plan, there is fulfillment because there's a reason for it. Now I could go back beyond, I can go back in, in some of my family lines to a, a guy called Adam. Because mom has uh, 17 lines that go to a guy by the name of David, the first king of Greater Scotland, and he has a well-documented lineage that goes back to David, the Hebrew king. And then we can pick up an inscription and carry it on back. And he made a way. I'm standing here and breathing, trying to think, and talking to you because he made he had a plan for me and made a way for me in history. Inconceivable. <coughs> think about the kind of intelligence that control that. It's so far beyond us. And we and we can at a at a directional thought tune in to the source of that. Awesome. Inconceivable. So I stand before you grateful that I'm here. Grateful that he's given me the privilege of life. And grateful that he's provided a way for each of you. And I'm going to leave you with a paraphrasing a verse in Ephesians. Before the foundation of the world, I knew you as my very, I chose you. Choosing means you're here, and he made a way for you in history. Let's have prayer today. Father, you are so awesome, and we thank you that, uh, that we can tap in to your mind, your resources, and your plan for us. And I thank you, Father, for who and what you are, what you've done 
in my life and uh, and and constantly, uh, Father, I'm aware that in spite of all the brokenness that uh, I have as an individual, that somehow, some way, you can use even me. We praise and thank you, Father, and, and ask you, we each ask you, Father, to light the way that we, we might go with you. Because you not only have been with us in our past, and you are with us now, but you await us in our future. In Christ's name, amen. 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 A couple more minutes. I looked at my watch and I cut it. So if you can bear with me. Is that all right? Sure. Yes. I, I had a DNA. Everybody know what DNA is? DNA is. I, I won't. I won't. I won't give you the definition of and all that. But we are all made up of DNA. It's one of the most intricate molecules on this planet. If you could put a DNA molecule has enough memory in it that's one cell less than a cell in you. If you could computerize it, you could computerize it. If you could no, see, you don't need a full cell to get DNA. If you can computerize that, you would have a massive, you would have a massive computer. It controls everything from the curl of your eyelashes to the thickness and consistency of your toenails. And there is, uh, uh, scientists only know what 40% of it does. 60% of the DNA molecule, they have no idea what it, what it does. And I was talking to a guy who's a global authority on DNA. He's a good buddy of mine. His name was, uh, I forgot his name actually. <laughs> <laughs> Stuber. And uh, Bud was, actually, he. Anybody ever see CFI Miami or CMI, whatever? CSI. CSI. Well, the, the original two years of that is based on his files. He was the head of the crime lab in Miami. And he was the one that really put into mainstream using DNA and criminology. And he lectured all over the world, Scotland Yard, and all over the world. We were speculating what is in that 40%. And I said, but is it possible that virtual memory is in that 40%? And he said, oh, absolutely possible. <coughs> Think about that. You're afraid of fires. You're afraid of snakes. You're afraid of heights. Maybe you had a great, great grandfather that survived falling from a high supply, high place. He survived, your line survived, memory was handed down, and you have those fears. You're sitting in a movie, you're looking at a, you're looking at a historical context movie, and somehow you're related to it in a strange, strange way. Perhaps ancestral memory reaching out through your consciousness, and you're saying, this is... Ear, it's eerily familiar, you know, like deja vu all over again. You ever hear the, the, the studies down at the University of Minnesota? It's where Mortensen's from. They took 132 sets of identical twins. They're the only thing on the planet that share identical DNA. 132 sets of identical twins. And they had two things in common. First, was neither one knew that the other existed. They had been adopted out, two different families, radically different in many cases, socioeconomic conditions. In, in one instance, uh, the, the boy was raised in the Hitler Youth in Germany, and the other, and his brother, who was actually Jewish, half Jewish, was raised as a Sabra in Israel. They brought them together post age 55, but they tested them before they brought them together. Neither one knew the other existed. The whole thing was done to authenticate or try to authenticate a behavioristic approach that 
Nurture was everything nature was not. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. It's how you're, the environment you're raised in shapes everything that you do. Forget about, forget about who your heritage is. That's minor. They brought them together and they tested them. They, they liked the same kind of music. They, uh, they drove the same kind of cars, they, they, they picked the same type of husbands, they picked the same type of careers. If one was religious, the other was religious. I think that's good. They liked the same colors. In fact, in fact, it verified that Nurture was a minor role player. And nature was the big role player. They suppressed the study because it didn't conclude what they wanted it to conclude. Mm -hmm. And finally it came out years later. They took trained rats, extracted the pituitary fluid from a trained rat, and injected it into an untrained rat. The untrained rat learned in seven tenths less time what the trained rat knew. You want to go down and get an injection for a lesson? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. How does that correlate to scripture? How does that correlate to the first part of what I was talking about? We think we go into a bifurcation of decision making, but do we? I can go this way or that way, and I've got to play historically, it's all ready here to inherited memory where I'm already starting to lean. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting, too, that you run in the scriptures that says uh, your sins will be on your children and your children's children. Remember, sins inherited through the male line, the paternal line. That's why, of course, Jesus Christ had to have a virgin mother. Because sin comes through the Father, and he is born sinless. So I wonder, you know, the, the thing the thing on the identical twins thing, when one was religious, the other was religious? Wow. Wow. <coughs> That's wild. Wow. That means there was an order of things way back there. You not only survived history physically, but your whole mental complexity is also in the care of a super intelligence. Awesome. Awesome. Any questions? <laughs> Can you talk again? <laughs> so you like to look at numbers? Sorry, you like to look at numbers? You like to look at numbers? Do I? Yeah. No, that is a sedative one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if I need to go to sleep, that's that. You know, I'm going to pick that up by chapter three. It should, it should, it should be my favorite, though, shouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. You like Matthew one? Yeah. <laughs> I, that's always intrigued me too. You know why they went to the genealogy of somebody who had no DNA in the board. Mm -hmm. That was always always intriguing. Mm -hmm. All right, we have five minutes, so I'm going to share one extra biblical theory with you. When we check out of the system, we check out of time. Perceptual time. I perceive time because I'm going to die. How about uh, how about back in the garden? You remember remember the Lord told Adam and Eve, "Dying, thou shalt surely die." Oh, that one. Dying physically, no, dying spiritually. I've cut off communication with you. You shall die physically. I wonder if before that there was a measurement of time. 
why would you have a measurement of time if nothing dies? There's rejuvenation of the cellular structure of the being, of the human. It rejuvenated itself like your liver does. So why would I why would I have a, a five trillion four hundred and fifty-six millionth birthday party? <laughs> and remember, remember the garden is a is a garden place. The earth was not a paradise, only the garden. The earth was chaos. Remember when they when they when they left the garden, was it it was all Flowers and roses and no, it was chaos. So they were. So I. So I wonder. I wonder if while they were in the garden, if the whole age of the dinosaurs outside that garden took place, and time began with dying, thou shalt surely die. So we check out of a time system, and we stop here, and then we. It's no longer relevant. We move into a non-time system. We can't, we can't grasp that. Everything that we, everything we do and say is related to time. We move into a non-time system. So I wonder, when we check out of the system, what does the Bible say about when we die? Ask with the body, as a present of the Lord. Lord. If we, when we check out of this system, our next consciousness, I have to use the time term, the next million nanosecond, I'm in the presence of the Lord, right? But we're in a non-time system, so we can't use that. But our next awareness, our next awareness, we're in the presence of the Lord. In the time system, that might be 60,000 years. It doesn't matter. Because we're in a non-time system. So I believe, from my studies, that when we check out of this system, nobody is in the non-time system in eternity waiting for time to catch up. <coughs> it's ludicrous. <coughs> How can you be waiting in non-time for time to catch up? When we check out of the system, all, all history has culminated. Everything that's going to happen in the future has already happened. Our next awareness, which is immediate, the time, the time word, which is immediate, is the great homecoming. Can you imagine that? Everybody arriving rejoicing simultaneously another time term. No. So nobody's up there looking down. It's spiritualism. That's ridiculous. Nobody's up there looking down. I just feel like he's looking down on our funeral today and saying, no. Where that is may not even be up to look down. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's right. Just something to think about this afternoon. <laughs> right. Any questions on that? Yeah, let us pray. Father, thank you again for this message, that uh, this heartfelt message that I might say that we felt here today that uh, we can take with us through the remainder of the week and not only the heartfelt message but the history lesson as well. Thank you for the speaker and inspire him to go forward, dear Heavenly Father, and, and spread the gospel. And we ask that we do the same thing and that you uh, bring us back next week for another message. And we thank you so much for the people that uh, work so hard each week to put this together and guide us. Guide us now, go with us, and uh, forever uh, keep us in your fold. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's remember to be good to Sundays.